Thank you, thank you, Marcia. What a wonderful, unexpected treat. Good morning. It's wonderful to see so many people here. I'm Nancy Rakoff. I'm privileged to be the membership coordinator here at this church for just a little bit longer. And I appreciate you being here and being so supportive of our church. As you know, we're coming to you live from the sanctuary, but we are also broadcasting over Zoom, and then it'll be on Facebook and YouTube. So there are other people joining us. We just don't see them sitting next to us. Our church is of the liberal religious tradition and was founded in 1843. Think of that, before the Civil War. We're a big tent where all are welcome. We respect each other's beliefs and seek to grow together in knowledge and understanding. Our physical church home is on land that once belonged to the Peoria Nation. I say belonged, I'm not sure they thought about land ownership, but they lived here and created their own lives here. We honor them. If you would like more information and you're a visitor here, please fill out one of the pew cards in front of you and you'll get um, contacted by someone uh, this week, coming week, or if you may have already filled out something out in the foyer, that's just fine. After the service, we ask that you join us for coffee hour, and this is an all-hands-on-deck church, and I got a last-minute text, somebody is sick, and we need a couple people to volunteer to help clean up after coffee hour, so there are always opportunities here. So the coffee hour, rain holding off, is out on the patio. There will be a few people joining us on a screen via Zoom. We're so glad you decided to spend this time with us. It is so good to be in worship together. You're all doing such a great job spreading out. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the Reverend Jennifer Innes, and it is such a joy to be with this congregation in all the ways that we gather. Our mission includes promoting the freedom of human spirit, extending a love and welcome to all, and growing into the best we can be, and being part of helping to heal our world. And living into that mission is made possible by the gifts of members and friends. And we aren't yet passing the plate. The Offertory plates are in the back of the sanctuary, but there also is a link for online donations on Zoom and on Facebook, and of course, sending a check in the mail is terribly functional. So I encourage that as well, any day of the week, of course, too. Thank you for your gifts. Every contribution, every contribution of time and skill and money it adds up, and when all of this generosity of spirit and work and materials come together, we are refreshed and emboldened, and we are able to move into the future. So thank you. Oh, and speaking of uh, the hands on deck, as Nancy offered, that I think the weather is good enough, um, and if you are inclined to get hands in dirt, that the work day on the trail is is, uh, I think is expected to happen. Um, the sun is out and it is now beautiful. So if you're inclined to get a little muddy, go for it. The kids will be out there as well. Um, so I want to invite everybody to that also. In addition to the beautiful piano that we hear from our regular pianist, Ivy Dong, we have a special guest musician today. And I wanna welcome uh, Marsha Henry, Henry Liebenau, uh, Marsha is the concert master of the Peoria Symphony Orchestra, and she is treating us with performances on the violin. Thank you for joining us today, Marsha. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Linda Fairbanks, the board president, who has a word from the board and an update from the Toward Live Church Committee. Good morning, everyone. Do you know 
What an amazing congregation this is. We have stuck it out together through this stinking pandemic for going on two years almost. Can we have a round of applause for sticking it out? I had a moment as I was sitting here thinking, you know when you wait for something and you work on something and you hope for something and you finally look around and it's happening? It's happening. We're together, we're in one place, we're virtual, the sun is shining, it's happening. So on behalf of the TLC, the Towards Live Church Committee, I would like to thank you for your most, most recently, for your near perfect response to the reduced capacity for attendance in the sanctuary. Since we started September 12th, we've been averaging just about 50 in the sanctuary, counting staff, performers, and ushers. We have not been using the seats in Fellowship Hall, and there is space for 25 there. So if you've been holding off and watching virtually, know that there is still room if you would like to come and join us. This capacity limit will be in place until October 10th for sure. Stay tuned for any adjustments. Also on October 10th, be sure and join us right after the service for a congregational town hall meeting. This is on the pandemic, so we would like to talk, hear concerns, answer questions, and just have time together on this specific topic. So please join us. This will be hosted by the UU Board of Trustees and the TLC Task Force. We have been a little less than perfect keeping three feet apart when we're out at coffee hour talking and visiting. It is hard to do, but please just check, make sure that we're maintaining some physical distance there. The good news is that the transmission of the virus, which I watch every day and probably multiple times a day in our community is diminishing slowly, but surely with masks and vaccination, we're going to get there. So keep hoping and keep showing up. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I know it is uh, a challenge to figure out how to be with each other and how to be, give each other space. So you know, let me invite us, as we're, even as we're outside, because we have people who have children at home or people in their lives who uh, are still at risk um, and have not had a chance to be vaccinated. It's still what we want to do to kind of care for each other is to, we can talk to each other and give all the dance space if you will, my dance space and your dance space, and we can cha-cha, and this is great. <laughs> and now, let us fully enter into worship.
from my colleague, the Reverend Kimberly Chomjack Carlson. It is not by chance that you arrived here today. You have been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you, there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. And through your struggles, someone, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so, you begin seeking out a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to the possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. This, this can be, and for many of us is, that heart home. Welcome, welcome to worship. Our chalice lighting was created for uh, the congregation for the occasion of my installation last March by uh, our member, Cinda Thompson. Um, and she drew from our mission and covenant in its creation. Our chalice curves, catches the spark, and bursts into a flame, beckoning across space through darkness to light a way for each seeker on a journey unfolding into pain and into beauty. Reach forward, clasp open hands, form a circle, celebrate our infinite forms, join and spirit, join in our beloved community, kindle the courage, what is needed for real change. Come and help heal our world. And let us enter into our first hymn, We Are Gathered. Yeah. 
So, let's have a story. I will offer what was supposed to happen was that we were supposed to have a recording from Amy Pop enjoying reading the story. But I can see it because we have this lovely confidence monitor, so I will offer the story instead. And this is all good. All right. Our story today is I Got a Family by Melrose Cooper, Pictures by Dale Gottlieb. I. <laughs> You know, this is family, right? We are embodied right here because we figure it out. We find the path. Yeah. I got a great grand who loves me still. Whispering quiet when she will. Can't see me coming, but knows I'm there. Touches my face and pats my hair. Smile cackle across her crinkling lips. Life oozes from her fingertips. I got a grampy, loves me sweet, takes me to Frosty's for a treat. Gives me the cherry right off his dish and all of his whipped cream if I wish. Calls me his sugar and pumpkin pie. Says I'm the sparkle in his eye. I got an uncle, loves me wishing. He's got a special place for fishing, says that he shared it just with me. Hunkering under his willow tree, right where the riverbed meets the streams, we bait our gear and cast our dreams. I got an auntie, loves me teaching. Take me out for an expedition. Over the play field, through the park. Watching the dust turn into dark. Hearing the bats and night hawk cries. And counting the planets in the skies. I got a brother, loves me hard. Roughhousing in our fenced in yard. Teaching me hoop shots over at school. Or swimming and floats at the public pool telling me things just brothers know, all about our relatives long ago. I got a daddy, loves me high, swings me in circles in the sky, turning me into a super soar. I am an outer space explorer. Softens my landing, smooth and slow, steadies me till the Dizzies go. I got a mama loves me sewing. Keeps all the hems of my dresses growing. Lengthens my sleeves when they, when they shrink a lot. Makes other pants when the old don't fit. Swirls me in colors every few. Wraps me in comfort all the year through. I got a kitty loves me furry. Weaves through my legs and gets all purry. Plays the whisker tickle with my face. Stretches me in our sunny place. Mews me a thank you when she's fed. And washes up clean when it's time for bed. I got a family loving me. Pushing and pulling and shoving me into paths where I gotta go. Giving me all that I gotta know, piling up feelings in a stack. And I got a heart that loves them back. Thank you for joining me for the story. And now let us sing out the children and youth to their programs today. This, we have Go Now in Peace.
Marge Kuyp reminds us, as surely as we belong to the universe, we belong together. We join here to transcend the isolated self, to reconnect, to know ourselves to be at home, here on earth, under the stars, linked with each other. We are here to join and share the sorrows and the joys that are among us, to make known what is in our minds and on our hearts. And I want to offer, uh, I want to begin with our joys for a report from Donna Dickey. Uh, she celebrates the birth of a great grandson, yes, Liam Mason Schrock born to Mackenzie and Mason Schrock of Goodfield, Illinois on September 22nd. Congratulations to the whole family and welcome Liam to the earth. Also want to offer another joy uh, from BJ and Terrence Lindsay to celebrate their amazing son, Ross, whose 24th birthday is October 3rd. Today, happy birthday, Ross, today. We also have a couple of sorrows to note. We have a sorrow, but with hopeful thoughts from BJ Lindsay also uh, for her close friend, Christine, who is scheduled for mastectomy surgery on October 7th. May everything go well and may her healing be uneventful. We also have an additional note of sorrow. I apologize, I don't have a name with this one, but an additional note of sorrow uh, for a, a, a mother, a parent who's working, worried about their son's health and well-being. Let us hold that additional sorrow in our hearts as well. Let us take one more moment for all the joys and sorrows, the names and the milestones that are among us. There is so much that lives in our lives and remains unspoken and even unshared. Let us lay that down here in this time set aside within the embrace of the congregation. Let us pause for a moment. I will light our candles and we will pause in the quiet. Amen. Our reading is from Adrienne Marie Brown and from her book, Emergent Strategy. Adrienne Marie Brown is an activist, a doula, a black feminist. Her genre of writing is Afrofuturism. She is writer in residence at the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute and her work is deeply informed by the black author Octavia Butler. And she says, when we are engaged in acts of love, we humans are at our best and most resilient. The love and romance that makes us want to be better people, 
the love of children that makes us change our whole lives to meet their needs, the love of family that makes us drop everything to take care of them, and the love of community that makes us work tirelessly with broken hearts. Love leads us to observe in a much deeper way than any other emotion. If love were the central practice of a new generation of organizers and spiritual leaders, it would have a massive impact. If the goal was to increase the love rather than winning or dominating a constant opponent, I think, I think we would actually manage, imagine liberation from constant oppression. We would imagine liberation from constant oppression. We would suddenly be seeing everything we do, everyone we meet, not through the tactical eyes of war, but through the eyes of love. We would see that there is no such thing as a blank canvas, an empty land, or a new idea. But everywhere there is complex, ancient, fertile ground full of potential, we would understand that the strength of our movement is in the strength of our relationships, which would only be measured by their depth. Here ends the meeting. Let us enjoy our music for meditation.
Connect. Only connect, writes the British author Ian Forster. He gives that voice through one of his characters in the novel, Howard's End. Only connect. That was the whole of her sermon. Only connect the prose and the passion, and both will be exalted, and human love will be seen at its height. Live in fragments no longer. Only connect. Through his character, Margaret Schlegel, Forster gives voice to his greatest concern that we human beings would, in fact, get past our biases and self-imposed limits, the categories of class and gender, and that we would truly communicate. Now, he was a white, middle, upper-class man in Britain in the early 1900s and was also as much part of the system of separation and oppression as anything as he was advocating against. At the same time, Forster is not wrong. In two words, he names our deep desire and our need as human beings. Connect. Only connect. For this month, we begin our reflection on cultivating relationship. And I was thinking about, as we were beginning this, in this moment, to go back to the beginning, back to where relationships are born. What is the context? Where do they come from? Those ones in particular that add into our lives, that fill us up. Now, for many of us, that would be family, um, the ones that we have inherited along the way, the ones that have embraced us and nurtured us and been there through so many of the seasons of our lives, but there was always a beginning in the relationship with family. But, but of course, there's so much more, and of course, family is complicated by itself, but there's so much more in terms of our relationships. There are, I'd say, exponentially as many ways to begin relationship, the ones that are meaningful and, and, and restorative in our lives, uh, probably exponential compared to the people in the world. So I wanted to open up the question and kind of tap into our collective experience. So I put out, uh, as we do these days, I put out a query on Facebook and into our internal email group at the church. And this is, of course, totally anecdotal and entirely unscientific. <laughs> Just so you know. But what showed up? And I will say there was indeed variety. Of course, many people spoke about family, spoke about having the children in, that had came, come into lives that had borne them, that had welcomed them, that had nurtured them. There were some unexpected, uh, I think, survival stories, too. There was the surprise pregnancy. Oh, look, that's happening. OK. Or the child that endured through health problems and still was able to add into the people in that circle of that family. There were grandchildren. I think, I think uh, based on kind of some of my, my, my own mothers and regarding her grandchildren, I think there's kind of grandchildren, I think, is a, an opportunity for kind of bonus life. Um, you get bonus people in lives uh -huh. because of the access to grandchildren and how that can have unique relationships um, that are fostered across generations and finding kindred spirits along the way. But of course, there's more. There was the story of college roommates who became fast friends because one person arrived and was willing to deal with a whole room full of crickets <laughs> that was freaking out everybody else. <laughs> so one person arrived and kind of made things right, and that was an, off, an instant bonding moment. There were people that you know, encountered each other and found partners and lives together because they simply overlapped one with another. 
and met and met again and then met enough to say, yes, we do with each other. But there was also some interesting bonding moments, um, bonding over being cautioned against somebody else and then having the courage to say, oh, hey, I was cautioned about you. And the other person say, yeah, I was cautioned about you too, so let's meet and let's be friends. But also connecting over having common backgrounds, the same kind of difficult religious experience in the past. But boy, the friendships really came out in this conversation too. And some of these emerged, have emerged over lifetimes. I think uh, one in particular, you know, Judith Corn Shanahan talked about the poignancy of deep and long friendships that started way back earlier in her life. Um, groups of people finding each other and that as humans do, that, not, that, that people have died along the way and recognizing so much how our time is limited, which makes that desire for connection all the more imperative and the success of it all the more precious. And then there's, of course, becoming family by choice. I think Terry Matthews talks about the person that she's connected with um, and having lunch with each other every Saturday nearly for 48 years. That's family. And lastly, I'll offer an entirely other form of relationship. Um, Carol Manny talking about being a teacher and establishing her class as a safe space and how some of those relationships grew into connections um, during the teaching, but also then lasted beyond and beyond. I wanted to really start with naming what feeds us. So thank you for everybody who's naming kind of what has fed you in the course of things. You know, there is so much in our world that undermines our ability and options for nourishing, that interferes with acknowledging the humanity in each of us and encourages us to be separate and to be separated and not be trusting. But let's start with what has been sustaining and naming and restoring us. And in that I want to go, I want to go deeper into that need and the struggle about connection uh, with Brene Brown, who's a, a white female researcher and storyteller. She sought to quantify connection and those of us in the adult education program on Thursday night with this congregation enjoyed her talk uh, on the power of vulnerability. Now, Brene Brown has extensive research uh, and background in social work. And she's one of those people, you know, in being with social work, you're working with the squishy and messy in life. But she's one of those people, she will say, who's, who is willing to work with the squishy and messy and then and then ca categorize it and put it into a bento box for lunch. So wanting to tame the squishy and messy and to measure it. So here's part of what she did. She said, when you ask people, in her research about connection, she said, when you ask people about love, they tell you about heartbreak. And when you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you about their most excruciating experiences of being excluded and when you ask people about connection, the stories they told were about disconnection, which kind of threw her for a loop. She was like expecting to have like all these great stories and to be quantifying this and here's what connection looks like, here's what love looks like, and then she's like, wait, there's more. What she found was that having love and depth meant taking a risk, being vulnerable, showing your softness and what makes you and what matters to you. But so many people she encountered felt they weren't worthy, that they had an internal sense of shame. Something about them was not okay inside. And so she went on to study. 
shame, and one year became six, and there were stories, and more small groups, and more stories, and she was like, I'm gonna figure this out. She went deeper into her research and found that the great difference between those who have a sense of, a strong sense of love and belonging, and those who don't, is, is wrapped up in that sense of shame, but those who really have this strong sense of love and belonging tend to be those who are willing to take a risk, willing to go first in saying, I love you, willing to be vulnerable in reaching out and saying, hey, let's go to coffee, willing to act from courage, the strength of the heart. Now, I will offer that that she, she quantified it as kind of, these people tend to have this and these people tend to have this. And I will say, with my experience as a minister, neither of those are fixed states. That those of us who are, you know, can visibly, might, in her research, might have offered love and risk and willingness to, to connect and belong. And those of us who are having a harder time with extending ourselves and making that connection, I mean, she kind of divided people into two categories, but I'm going to say that that's, it's, it's not that simple. That there are some moments, I'm going to say, I don't think it's just me, but I think there's some moments when I'm great at being willing and feeling like, yes, I'm going to, make, I'm going to take a step, I'm going to make a risk out there, and I'm going to extend myself for the sake of love and connection. And at the same time, the next day, I might say, uh-uh that I'm not feeling I want to make that extension and that connection. It's not that you have two groups of people. It could be any day and any hour, frankly, that we switch. But the more that we can find a way to say yes, to say I care, to extend the self, the more likely we're to grow that, the more likely we might feel more worthy on a day when we don't really feel worthy. One of our great tasks in, as human beings and certainly in congregations, in Unitarian Universalism, is to be cultivating a love that adds to what we already have. I'm going to make a leap and say that those of us who are here, connected to the congregation in person, online, in all the ways, have already done some extension, have said, I need, and I'm going to find a place and a people and a message, and have already shown up. You're kind of self-selected, right? You're pre-screened, pre-approved for the credit card, if you will. We're here. But I also know that on every given day, we may or may not feel loved, lovable, worthy, or worthwhile. And then, of course, we also need to make room for people who feel even less worthy. So our task is to keep cultivating, is to keep nurturing and growing, even whether or not we feel worthy, but to know that the value of it is something. It makes a difference. And so we tap back into the memory, the experience of those relationships that strengthen us already, where we begin and keep jumping from those out into the world, being willing to extend ourselves out again. That we only connect and live in fragments, well, as little as possible. And we do this for ourselves and for our children and for those who come into the door, but also for a larger cause and a larger 
purpose that we fight for ourselves and others too, even when the struggle is long because that worthiness, that, that appreciation, that respect, it's not just for our comfort, but we bring it out and say there's a larger message that the world needs to hear as well. You know, yesterday, there were solidarity rallies and marches across the country on behalf of reproductive rights, on the right of people to be able to make their choices about their health and their bodies. And Peoria Proud, one of our local organizers in support of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and asexual, and more community, hosted our own Yes for Choice rally yesterday afternoon to bring awareness of the need for people to have access to abortion services, in particular in response to the new law in Texas that cuts off access to abortion after six weeks. Oh, it's been just about six weeks since that law went into effect, right? So we're here in the struggle, and some of us are here in the struggle thinking, I've already done this struggle. I've already done this struggle, right? The UUA, our association, sent out a reminder that was helpful to me, which was some things are always worth fighting for. And this is one of those values that are always worth fighting for. And this is an expression of love, an extension of the self to stay in the effort and the advocacy. As Marie, Adrienne Marie Brown reminds us, when we are engaged, we are at our best and most resilient. When we are engaged, we are at our best and most resilient. If we could center love as the practice of a new generation of organizers and spiritual leaders, she said, it would have an impact, it would increase our resilience not with a goal of winning, but with liberation for all of us. To keep saying, it's not just some people are worthy, not just some people get to be loved, but all of us are in it together. Simply by saying yes to relationship, we shift the frame. We run counter to the culture of separation and the pitting of each other against one another. And we start with recognizing the health and the love and the care we already have around us and within us. And that we take up all of the fragments of our lives and keep preparing the ground for more love to be cultivated. Cherish the ways that we find each other and all the ways they begin. Create a place of welcome and wholeheartedness, reinforcing what is already here and preparing the space for those who need it more deeply. Let us go forth, caring for ourselves, caring for others, and raising a new generation of leaders centered in love that is fierce and liberating and universal. Let us go forth. Amen. Our closing hymn is Lean on Me from Bill Withers. you won't let 
手。